How you guys doing? I'm so glad there's not like bright lights in my face because then I can't see you guys. All right, so uh, I don't think I need to speak here because he just told you everything you needed to know. Um, but uh, it's good to be in DC. Actually, uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of a company called Uber and we're about to get some things going on D in, in DC. So it's fun to just be in the environment and see what the taxis are like here or not like here. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna get going. Uh, just with a brief history of myself, I, I basically, I like to tell stories, I'm a storyteller. I also, you know, I've worked with a number of entrepreneurs for a long time and I always think the best advice starts with stories. And so I'm gonna tell personal stories. Um, and you, there's little lessons to learn along the way. And uh, so it's gonna be half sort of, you know, angel investing stuff and then I'm gonna go into Uber. And uh, let's get started. So when I was a kid, I was a geek, and uh, I was a coder from basically the sixth grade on. I had a Commodore 64, and I was, I was jamming. Best text editor ever was on the Commodore 64 for any of the geeks here. Um, and you know, I was playing like, I was building like choose your own adventure games and things like this. Uh, my first company was actually when I was 18. Uh, I started t teaching SATs. Uh, the first person I tutored went up 400 points, and, and then one of the fathers of the kids that I was tutoring said, let's start a school. So we did New Way Academy. I was, I was the internal guy, so I did all, I created the course, I did all the teaching, I trained the teachers, he did all the marketing. It was a lot of fun. But then I got sick of filling in A, B, C, D, and E. It was just, I couldn't take it anymore. So then I started coming with a bunch of friends called Scour. And we were pretty much the original P2P pirates. Um, so we basically created a peer-to-peer -peer search engine and application in uh, 97, late 97. And uh, we got sued, for, like, Frank took my thunder. We got sued for a quarter of a trillion dollars by 33 of the largest media companies in the world. <laughs> so we didn't have that in our back pocket. And we said, you know, what are we going to do? Well, we, we, turned, we, turned, we turned the technology off, ended up selling it for about $10 million in a Chapter 11 proceeding, which I'll get into later. Very interesting to see your, your, your company sold in a courtroom in a matter of minutes. Do I hear a seven? It is seven and a half, and there's like three bidders. It's pretty hilarious. Um, so, so, so what I did is I started a company after that, uh, Basically, it was called Red Swoosh. And the idea was to take our deep peer-to-peer -peer expertise and turn those 33 litigants that sued us, take that same tech and turn them into customers. So those dudes who sued me and shut me down were now paying me. It was like the ultimate revenge. And so I, the reason there's a light bulb is I, like, I went from like this sort of like rogue dude to like trying to turn it and like create a real business. I call this my innovator phase, let's say. Uh, then I went, you know, after that I did basically 10 years straight of P2P and I was a little burned out and so I started angel investing um, to just sort of unwind, recharge. Um, I did pretty well. I sold Red Swoosh to Akamai for a good amount of money. We stayed scrappy because we started January 01. Four of those years I did not take a salary. One of those years I was living at mom's. Not a lot of ladies. Um, <laughs> so I went, I had to recharge. I like to say money will not buy you happiness, but it will pay for therapy. Um, so I went into what I call my curator phase. And that is, um, basically I, I wanted, to, I, I'm entrepreneurial at my core, but I, I was so burned out I couldn't do it myself. And so I was basically investing in really awesome entrepreneurs. These are two famous uh, curators out of New York that built a, you know, they're sort of scrappy. They, they built, they, they identify talent very early and they have this enormous collection which is, um, you know, pretty fascinating. And that's kind of how I look at my investing, my angel investing. Now I'm in the driver mode. I mean, if you can just put yourself next to the, I mean, I love it. All right, so, um, yeah, so Uber. And so this is like, I've, I've done some stuff now I know how to run companies. I've had hard times, I've had good times, and now we're hitting something that's like really tapping into something powerful. And it's about hitting the gas hard. And uh, Uber's a lot of fun, I'll get to that later in the, 
in the presentation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my angel days uh, and some of the things I did. Um, I, I like to think of, well, some of my entrepreneurs that I work with, they think of me as the wolf in uh, Pulp Fiction. That's the guy on the left, Harvey Keitel. Um, this particular scene reminds me of a time when one of my entrepreneurs came to me and he said, um, I just signed a deal with a venture firm without the approval of the board. And he had 20 angels who didn't know about this deal. It was a lot of fun. So yeah, you get up at 5 a.m. and you have to deal with some shit, all right? Uh, this right here is, um, I had a company who had a billionaire investor who owned half the company who had made some really bad investments and was basically, go is basically on the verge of going bankrupt. He called us and said, uh, we want to liquidate, I want to liquidate my 50% holding in your company and I want to do it by next week. And there were some interesting things you can do because when somebody wants to sell and they're in a hurry to, you can put the squeeze on. So we did some cool stuff there. This is just hilarious. Okay. Um, all right. So I like to think, like a lot of entrepreneurs would come, come to me, uh, you know, they have great ideas. They have some, the core of them, something really beautiful that they're doing and an amazing entrepreneur, but they don't know how to raise money. And so it, I make bets, right? I don't sit there and wait for all the other angels to like get something done. I make bets and I do what I call, I, I'm a funding shepherd. So all those sheep, those are, the no, those are most of the angels and the VCs, and, and I'm sure I'm the shepherd. This is a horrible analogy. I hope none of you are religious, because you're just going to smack me down. All right, here we go. <laughs> I'm having too much fun with this one. Um, I was also sort of like the interim CXO for the companies I'd work with. I wouldn't do like... 500 startups, I'm going to invest in everybody everywhere. I'm throwing dollars, what up, make it rain. That wasn't me. <laughs> Instead, I was the guy that would go deep with every entrepreneur that I'd work with. And I was the ringer. If they needed to go do an enterprise sale, bring them in. We'll dunk on you. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, Frank talked about Proprietor, the proprietor of the jam pad, I had a house. You know, I made, made a little money, got a house, and I had a bunch of, uh, I have a bunch of rooms. They're open, they're available, and nobody's staying in them. So, uh, you know, sometimes people would couch surf in my place, but mostly people would just come by at any time of the day when I was doing my angel stuff. And we would just have jam sessions, like jazz musicians, except we're entrepreneurs. It was a different kind of artist, but an artist nonetheless. And curating, we talked about that. So who am I? I'm really freaking curious. <laughs> it's gotten me into trouble at certain times in my career. <sighs> I'm Rain Man analytical. I'll count toothpicks on the floor. Or if I'm on a hike, I'll count how many steps I made over three hours. It's weird, I know. Uh, I'm scarred. I mean, you go through a situation where, uh, where you don't have a salary for four years, and you hear a hundred no's for four years straight, a hundred no's a day for four years straight, that shit breaks you down. Um, makes you a little angry and weird. Um, <laughs> but I'm also, I also have brave heart passion. I'm passionate about the things that I do. And um, I think anybody who knows me would tell you that. The things that I do are about, they're about heart and they're about killing it. So some cool factoids, and then we'll, we'll start getting into other stuff soon. I'm, it's pretty hilarious. I can't believe I did this. All right. Um, I sold $20,000 worth of knives in a summer. I don't know anybody else here who did the vector marketing cutco thing. I got bamboozled into selling knives. Yes, I sold a ton of knives. Okay. Uh, I did get sued for the GDP of Sweden. That's $250 billion. Another factoid, I've had three different billionaires on my board. That's Michael Ovitz on the bottom, that was Scour. Ron Burkle on the right, hanging with P. Diddy, Puffy, whatever his name is these days. And uh, Mark Cuban was actually involved in Red Swoosh, that was my last company. I sold a business in a courtroom, pretty awesome, talked about that. I've controlled a 
20 million machine botnet. That was my last company. Um, I never sold it that way. Probably one of a handful of people who knows how to do symmetric to symmetric NAT traversal. I'm a geek, I'm an engineer by training. If anybody wants to throw down on NAT traversal, let's do it. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Um, anybody here see the social network? The dinner where Parker meets uh, meet Zuck and you know the other founder. I was I was at that dinner. Me and Parker were basically taking those guys out to dinner to like really like impress them and whatnot. And I was replaced by a pretty Asian woman. <laughs> so I've done I've had hard I've had good times and hard times. Like I said, I freaking guarantee. I guarantee it, and this is like how Gary Vaynerchuk does thumb wars with everybody. He says, I'll, I'll beat anybody in a thumb war. I will beat anybody at being the non-luckiest entrepreneur in the room. Definitely not unlucky, but damn, I had to do some time. Um, I am non-lucky. I'm more non-lucky than anybody. So some of the collection of companies that, I, that I've done, here it is. This is the collection right here. This is my art collection. Um, they're all awesome. Um, right now, I'm doing Uber, as probably some of you know, and we'll get into some of the coolness there in a second. Uh, Jampad lessons, just some little sound bites, things I've learned over the years. Preemption is bad. Uh, if an angel or a VC comes to you and wants to preempt, wants to basically get in the deal before anybody else can look at it, and they're promising the world, and they're promising a fast deal, and they're promising rainbows and leprechauns and shit like that, tell them no. Um, create a process, get multiple people involved, that's the only way to protect yourself. I could tell a billion stories for how this goes wrong. I could tell stories where I've done it even after giving myself that advice and still screwed it up. VCs tend to, tend to kill founding CEOs. Do not believe everything you read on a VC blog. They're all so founder friendly. They love founders. They they exalt them, put them on pedestals. They're beautiful people. We're just the measly VC. It is in the VC's nature to kill a founding CEO. It just is. Um, the, what it really comes down to is, well, let's see, we'll go, is that CEOs that survive are CEOs. There are forces all around you when you run a company, especially as you're growing or even not growing. There are forces all around you to take you out. And the ones that survive are the ones that are supposed to be there. Let's see, this one, fake it till you make it is BS. I hear this all the time, people are like, I'm a hustler. Dude, I'm awesome. You gotta hustle, you gotta fake it till you make it, what up? <laughs> and I'm like, that's bullshit. I'm like, you're lying to yourself and everybody around you, and I can, I can see it oozing out of your pores. People who lie to themselves and other people, um, people it's, it's obvious to others. And what you're doing is you are, you get to a point where either you can't sleep or you start sleeping 14 hours a night. And the only reason I know this is because I've been there. Uh, fear is the disease, hustle is the antidote. It is scary being a founder and entrepreneur. It's hard. And, you know, the reason why you fake it till you make it is because you're scared. But faking it isn't going to solve your problems. Hustling is. Getting shit done is. What are you scared of? Are you scared you're not going to make sales? Go call 100 people. What are you scared of? You're scared you're not going to get angel money because you just need to get another engineer to make things happen? Go get your angel money. Go talk to angels. Go network. Go to conferences like this. Just make it happen. Are you, what are you scared of? Go hustle and get it done. Funding doesn't solve all problems. Yeah, everybody's like, yeah, I'm successful. I just got a million dollars in the bank. What up? I just got five million or even $10 million in the bank. No, mo money, mo problems, right? <laughs> So don't, don't, think, don't think just because you got money in your, in your company's bank account that you're somehow successful, because you're not. So let's do some Uber stuff. This is my current passion project right now. Uh, well, I don't know what this slide's doing here. This is me and my co-founder in front of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> but this is where we came up with the idea. It's pretty hilarious. Uh, Uber is a unicorn, man. It's, you know, I had somebody, I had somebody send me, a good friend of mine send me an email yesterday going, dude, who does your PR? 
don't tell me you don't have a PR person and it's just you. I'm like, we don't have a PR person. I didn't say it was just me, I didn't say that. Um, what we have is a product that sells itself. It, every product, everything that's going to ultimately make it is a, a unicorn in its own way. Find that, expose it, communicate it, get it out there, that beautiful part of it. Uber's really beautiful and really easy, so it makes it easy to spread. Not everything's like that, but find that unicorn. People talk about it, I love Uber. Uh, a lot of people love Uber. Going to In-N-Out, uh, if those of you on the West Coast, do you have In-N-Out out here? I don't even know, you don't, oh, great hamburgers, oh my God, whoo. Uh, going to In-N-Out and tweeting about it, kinda lame. Going to In-N-Out and Uber, kinda awesome. So, you know, people tweet all kinds of crazy stuff and we have a lot of fun with it. Um, it's just a community of people who we're giving to them, we're giving them something they didn't have before, which is the ability to get around in urban environments. They're giving back, right? So when you put love into a product, you put love into communication to your community and your consumers, they bring it back. We don't have millions of riders. We have like, we're in tens of thousands. They pay us for real, but the, the amount of Twitter activity we get when there's no hooks even in the app is amazing, given the number of people that are actually on it. Big disruption, right? I don't know if you guys can read that. Um, yeah, so we got a cease and desist in San Francisco from the city of San Francisco, as well as the state of California, uh, basically saying shut down. Um, for a lot of legal reasons, I can't get into what I really think is going on there, but let's just say there's a conversation about whether Uber is Expedia or Orbitz, whether we're Orbitz or whether we're American Airlines, right? What's interesting is in the state of California, the cities regulate taxis and the state regulates limos. The state regulatory body, which is called the Public Utilities Commission, which regulates your energy and your water, also regulates your limos. Anyways, for every ride, for every ride that we do, we are under the potential penalty of an additional 90 days in jail. All right, got a lot of traction. So we have this thing internal at Uber, we call it Godview, and it shows all the cars on the system and uh, all the trips that are happening. It's an operational tool, we need to see what's happening real time. These were the early days. Here's what it looks like now, all right? Totally awesome, love this stuff. This is like a video game, um, late on Friday or Saturday night when you're not working and not going out. <laughs> I forgot to say, <laughs> all right, yeah, I don't go out very much. All right, here we go. Uh, yeah, you can't see the y-axis, I know, but wow, we're having a good time. Double, double rainbow <laughs> metrics. Uh, here's something interesting. So not only, you know, okay, revenues are going up, that's great. We have on a per user basis, more rides per user per month. It's going up. This goes through December, but now it's like already in the threes, right? At the same time, I sort of took, a, I did a cohort analysis. I said, okay, my first, you know, this, per, this user's first day on the system, and then let's look at how much money we made on their second day in the system, and their third day in the system, and the fourth day in the system. We did that for every user and said, every user, we lined it up on their first day. How much do we make on average in their first day? How much do we make on average in their second day? Et cetera, et cetera. And what you find is that it's going generally up. And so we can't even, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't determine lifetime value of a customer because the amount of money we're making per day per user is actually going up as they get older and older and customers, even when you include churn. So you may have only taken a ride in the first day, but you're still included in the denominator in the 180th day. What this means, it means that urban cities, I guess that's redundant, cities have very difficult transportation issues. That the way cities are being constructed and laid out, urban environment of today is a situation in which people do not have enough transportation alternatives to get around. And that is what we're tapping into. So uber fun. Because you don't want to just be efficient. We're efficient, man, we're gnarly efficient, but we're also fun. 
So we did this thing at South by Southwest. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys were there, um, but we basically said, you know, normally, you know, oh, I didn't even describe what Uber is. I can't believe it. Um, holy shit. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just. I know what it is. <laughs> All right, so I can't believe I started this without saying it though. So Uber is an on-demand, what did you say? No, uh, it's an on-demand black car service, on-demand town car service. What we like to say is everyone's private driver, right? Whip out your iPhone, push a button, and in five minutes a car appears, right? And you're like, how did that happen? I'm living in the future, what's going on? And you can see on your iPhone, you can see the car coming to you. Now, of course, you can do this on Android, too. Or if you are a BlackBerry user and you haven't switched yet, um, you can text us your address or location, just cross streets, and the same thing will happen. But on the BlackBerry, you can't see the, the car coming to you. How much time do I have, Frank? Are we good? All right, keep going. All right, so anyways, now that we know what Uber is, that's great. Um, I can't believe I did that. Okay, so we did this thing in South by Southwest. We have hundreds of cars on the system in San Francisco, right? But we did this thing at South by Southwest. We're not in Austin right now, but we wanted to do something fun. Everybody does something fun uh, at South by. And so we got all the pedicabs on our system. We had 105 pedicabs on our system and put really cool branding. Look at this, right? Again, we think of transportation as local. That affects how we do our marketing, right? I Uber Texas, right? So if you're a local, if you're a Texan, that's kind of fun, right? So make it fun and interesting to the people that are there. Of course, there's a lot of people descend upon it, but it was authentic. And it was their pedicabs, and we put the branding on there, but all of these cars were, or these cabs, whatever you want to call them, were on the system, and you could push a button, and in five minutes, a pedicab would arrive. And it was a lot of fun. People had a lot of fun with that. They were tweeting like crazy about their Uber petties. Another cool thing we did, Valentine's Day, um, we basically, again, no taxi has ever done this, ever, okay? We went, we distributed hundreds of roses to all of our drivers, and every woman that got into a car from 4 p.m. until midnight was handed a rose by the driver. I just got five dates. Uh, we did this, there's this thing, this race in San Francisco called Beta Breakers, right? And what happens is the city gets sliced in half by the course. So you go from the bay to the breakers, the ocean, and uh, you can't get around. So people part, there's like 100,000 people parting, not really running, and uh, you can't get around. So you see all these people straggling back at like 5 p.m. completely snookered. Um, wow, I can't believe I said that word. Um, so anyways, we give all the drivers headbands were thrown, you know, lots of headbands were being distributed. Uh, in the, we had like 20 stretches on the system. They had Jacks in there and, and Jacks, like Jack, Jack Daniels, uh, uh, vodka, as well as Gatorade, depending on how you want to roll, but you know, you could keep the party going, but we had fun with it, again. Um, so let's go into some of the math stuff that we do, because it's not just about fun. Making sure that you push a button and a car appears is a very difficult problem. Um, I could put a thousand cars in San Francisco and go out of business in like two weeks. So I need to make sure that I have the right number of cars. And what that means is I have to predict demand ahead of time. And then I have to figure out, well, given that demand, what's the right number of cars, which actually is a very, very complex uh, complex uh, sort of transition there. And then, of course, you can't just put all those cars right in the center of the city. You have to position those cars. And then there can still be unforeseen spikes in, in, in demand, and then what do you do? You go into a dynamic pricing scenario. So we have PhDs on staff. We have a nuclear physicist. We have a rocket scientist. We have a computational neuroscientist and a pure statistician, all on staff, like PhD dudes. Um, figuring out how to solve these types of problems. You can't see it really well because of the lighting, but this is San Francisco and the little dots of light, the heat map essentially, is where cars were when they accepted a pickup request. And man, I'm telling you, when this is black, when you see it, like, it's a beautiful picture. Why is it important? Because I cross this with where people were when they requested the cars 
And that difference in heat, cars are anti-heat, requests are heat, the difference is unserved demand, right? And so that helps us position cars, for instance. Here's another heat map, a little different. So the colors, like if you see the blue or black, that's 120 second pickup time. Um, so you can see in the heart of San Francisco, we have two minute average pickup times. As you get over into the more remote areas, it goes up to 10 minutes, maybe even 12 or 13 minutes in the really remote areas. When you push a button and a car arrives in two minutes, holy cow. I'm not gonna try to explain this. <laughs> and real quick, I'm gonna talk really quickly. I guess I only have one more minute. I, can I take the next person slot? No, okay. All right, so this is another map you can't see really well, but this is a heat map of New York. Not a, it's not really a heat map because we took this before we had launched in New York, before we had a single car in New York. We had a thousand credit cards on the system in New York and people were opening the app all the time, hoping that cars were around. And this heat map basically showed us where they were. So this is Brooklyn here and here. This is sort of, this is Midtown, this is Soho. I didn't know anything about New York until, until Uber. Um, but you have to learn, like a military strategist, strategist, you have to learn that city. And you have to understand how it works. Um, we thought we were gonna go after Brooklyn to start, but we're like, man, the heat is in the city. That's what we're gonna do. All right, so we have this map again. You can't really see it because of these lights here, but uh, it's super cool. Let's do some Q&A. Um, so you're competing against pretty entrenched competitors that have um, a lot of legal power and a lot of force behind them. How do you compete against a customer like that? So how do we compete against an incumbent? Well, first is make a service and a system that's better, right? So let's start with customer value. And then deliver that value in such a beautiful way that you inspire that, that customer to be on your side when the shit hits the fan, which it inevitably will. And then you just hope that sort of reason and right wins. And smarts, you gotta, you gotta navigate. You gotta be kinda, you know, I don't wanna say gangster about it, but you kinda have to, <laughs> <laughs> they'll go more gangster on me than I will on them, but you have to know how they think and you have to navigate the situa situation appropriately. Can you talk a little bit about your pricing model and are you surprised at how much people are willing to pay for a cab during beta breakers? Uh, our service is twice the price of a taxi in San Francisco. In New York, it's about 1.75 times a taxi. Um, am I surprised that they're willing to pay, that that many people are willing to pay? Um, people are price sensitive except when they're stranded. And so <laughs> they pay more. Um, what, we, what you will start to see from Uber is that we'll start to hit price points all the way down because our goal is to have more cars in a city than there are taxis, right? Uh, more Ubers in a city than taxis. And so that means you have to price discriminate at some point. Everything from like a black Prius to a, to a navigator, right? When you're like going around telling people about an idea you have that's just in the idea phase, how do you draw, straddle that line between like not giving away too much? Or do you have to be worried about giving away too much in those early stages of a startup? It's pretty rare that it matters. But I would generally avoid talking to people you think that will actually do it. So like, you know, go, going to somebody who is looking for the next startup and they've been looking at something just like yours, if you lay out your map, then you're giving it to them. But 99% of the time, it doesn't matter. And so just hustle, right? Yeah, just hustle it and you'll beat the other guys. At the end of the day, you're gonna have competitors. So just beat them. It sounds like you've had a lot of legal issues and you're having a lot of legal issues. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I was wondering, like, at what point do you not give up, but mm. when does it seem so daunting that the government of San Francisco has their eye on you? Yeah. Why, what makes you keep going? Um, the, the question, well, you know, look, if you're wrong, then at some point it's going to stop, right? The question is, are you going in, and I hate to use this wrong and right thing, but if you're going in obeying the law, but people are pissed off still, then that's a different situation. And then you can sort of go to that Braveheart slide I had before, or that like Hulk slide that I had before, and you know, 
then it's about your principles. And it's about, there is an expedience piece of this, but principles do matter. And uh, that's how you change the world, is by holding those principles over sometimes corrupt systems. Just a quick question. When are you guys launching in DC? DC is one of our summer cities. So this summer. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, but but we are looking for we are looking for a general manager who can run our city business, basically be responsible for the top line revenue, do some of the mar basically run the marketing that's going on in DC and come up with those ideas, as well as manage the supply chain, which is essentially the partnerships we have with all the fleets of cars. So if you know somebody who is analytical and has marketing flair. We're hiring, and it's a sweet job because that's going to be a fifty million dollar to hundred million dollar top line. So, yeah, practically speaking, what's the probability that you get shut down? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> that was a softball, man. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> So this is your summer city. How about internationally? I mean, this yeah. is kind of a question that probably pertains to a lot of startups sure. here. Some of the models are applicable, some are not. Yeah. I, feel like, I feel like yours is probably the most transferable yeah. going abroad. Yeah, it's going to be pretty quick. So I'd say I don't want to, I don't want to give up any news. But but yeah, so we'll Western Europe first, then Asia, and we look at it as a city by city thing. We're not like Twitter and we need to be global like that. We're actually just going, what are the top 50 cities that we need to be in? And we go after them one at a time. And if we have the resources and the manpower, the people to be there, then we will do it. I mean, Moscow's going to be interesting, man. I think I got legal problems here. Holy shit. <laughs> um, but I'm down. Like, there's a huge market in, in Moscow. I've seen the numbers. And if you know Russian, let's talk. You can run the business out there. <laughs> Love it. Let's go. Let's do it. I'll stay in the That's US, wonderful. it'll be awesome. La last question here of the day, here in the back. Travis, over here in the back. Back row, front, down, yep. yep. Boom, boom. So you have a really, this is a really, it seems to be a really complicated business model. You've got cars and you've got people who needs to be licensed and yeah. you've got a lot of space to cover. Sure. Could you describe just the, like what did the first week before the first rollout look like? Like how did you, when, you, when it went live, what did it look like? Well, when like? it started, it wasn't complicated at all. It was like, can I find one or two drivers to cruise around San Francisco so me and my friends can get a ride, right? So we just had a couple cars roaming around, and we're telling our friends, we're like, shh, we got cars, dude. Just get your phone and push a button. And they're like, oh my god. And then that's how it spread. It gets complicated when you try to scale it. But at the beginning, when we launched San Francisco, it was, it was fait accompli, like we're gonna do it. I think what does get complicated is then when you go to other cities like New York, highly competitive marketplace, tons of congestion, massive regulatory situation there, um, but huge demand at the same time. And you're like, that can get really complicated. That's the military strategist kind of hat you have to put on and say, how are we taking this city? Where's our beachhead? How are we handling logistics? Um, and it gets pretty interesting. And I think that was a really complicated one and something where we say we don't do two complicated cities at a time. That's why we're not doing LA right now. Because we need New York to get stable because we had huge impact of demand. We have to get supply systems where it needs to be. And, th and then once it starts to get to stable growth, then we'll do another complicated city. Actually, one more thing with that. Yep. That was great talk, Travis, but I think you started as a prototype in Austin. You want to talk about that real quick and then? That. We started as a prototype. Well, we, we had one or two cars in Austin, two South Bys ago, but we were just testing it out and nobody used it. Okay. Wasn't, wasn't ready yet? No. Okay, great. Thanks. Let's hear it for Travis Kalnick.